with Scott. And uh, Scott is preaching out in California at the Spiritual Leadership Conference at Lancaster Baptist Church. And Pastor was able to make the trip out there with him. And they are having a wonderful time together. I talked to him today, and he's so encouraged. And I had an opportunity this morning to watch a little bit of the message that Scott preached last night. And I know they enjoyed having him there, and God used him in a great way. And let's continue to pray for them. Uh, they'll be coming back here on Thursday, I believe. They're flying back, which is tomorrow. And so pray for them that they have a safe flight back. We're looking forward to the evening service that God has given us, and we'd like to welcome all those who are joining us via live stream as well. Uh, we're thankful that you've chosen to be with us tonight as well. Our ushers are standing by, and they have a packet of information in their hand for anybody who might be visiting for the very first time. If this is your first time at Cranberry, could you raise your hand? And I think it's just all us regulars. But if you need a prayer bulletin, you can raise your hand, and they'll put a prayer bulletin in your hand. We'll look at that here in just a moment together. So if you need a prayer bulletin, go ahead and raise your hand, and they'll make sure that you have one. Well, we're going to go ahead and stand. And if you have a songbook, you can open up to page 629, Love Lifted Me. And we're actually going to hold off on prayer right now. We'll look through our bulletin here in just a moment. And we'll actually pray after we look at the bulletin and before the offertory. We'll switch it up a little bit tonight. But page number 629 in your songbook, Love Lifted Me. Let's lift up our voices to the Lord. We'll sing all together, first, second, and third verse. there for a second you may be seated I got distracted I was looking around to see how many people were doing love lifted me and I only saw one person getting a calf workout tonight I was I was trying to behave myself because I'm up here on the platform but I did see I did see a, at least one or two uh, doing that and that's a fun thing to do during that song aren't you glad that Jesus Christ's love lifted us lifted us out of the depths of sin and uh, what a blessing uh, that is well, let's look at our prayer bulletin here, and we'll look at a couple of announcements very briefly before we jump into the prayer request. And uh, first, let me mention uh, that churchwide visitation is this Saturday. Uh, we were doing Tuesdays throughout the summer months, and we'll go back to that in the spring as well. And for next summer is the plan, but because of the sunlight and because of the change of the seasons, we'll actually be going out on Saturday mornings at 10 a.m., and the bus workers meet at that same time. We'll meet in the great room. And if you can be there on Saturday mornings, if you're able to be there, we'd love for you to go out with us. And I uh, talked to Pastor about this today, and he said, Pastor Chapel preached a great message about not calling it visitation, call it soul winning. 
And so pastor said, we might have to switch it back. I said, whatever you want, pastor. So we, uh, we go out soul winning. He that wins his souls is wise, right? And we're trying to lead people to know Jesus Christ as their Savior and asking that the Lord will use us. And so if you're able to go, we'd love to see you here this Saturday. If you're not able to go, pray for us as we do go, uh, that we would see fruit that would remain. And then family financial planning meeting is coming up on October 10th and 11th. And uh, Dr. Bob Valier will be with us, and he'll be available, and we'll have a sign-up sheet where you can sign up uh, to meet with him if you have any questions to ask him about, about your personal finances. We went away from the ladies' Bible study last month due to the fact that they went to the retreat, uh, but we will have our ladies' Bible study on the second Tuesday in October like we normally do. And then, of course, we also have our fall revival coming up in October, October 23rd through 25th, and Pastor John Wilkerson will be with us, and you won't want to miss that. Uh, we're looking forward to that. That's going to be a great week together. Let's look at a couple of these prayer requests together. You can see all of them listed there, but I'd like to point out just a handful of them. Alan Bragg, Karen Arricchio's son and Ruby Riley's son-in-law, had heart surgery on Monday, and so pray for him as he recovers from that surgery. And then Shirley Brogan is recovering from gallbladder surgery, and so we're hoping that will help her feel much better and uh, taking out that gallbladder. And then Fred Cooper is having issues with his eyes. Pray for him. Linda Dempsey had surgery on Tuesday. And uh, Cash Lawson, who is Gary and Donna Shoemate's grandson, and he was born with a heart defect and has had multiple heart surgeries. He's only four years old, and he's already had multiple heart surgeries in his life. Uh, but he's very ill right now, and in the hospital, they were doing breathing treatments and have him hooked up to IVs, and he's not wanting to eat, and Donna said if he doesn't want to eat, there's something wrong with him. She said that boy likes to eat, and, uh, but, but he was doing a little bit better today. I think they took him off the oxygen, and so pray for cash in the hospital. Uh, Mildred, Mildred Malcolm's blood platelets are very low, so let's pray for her. She's not feeling well, and then uh, pray for Tanya Palmer. Of course, we've mentioned James Pauley, pastor's brother, uh, with the blood clots that he's been dealing with. We're just asking for, for, him to, uh, for him to listen to the doctors to be able to recover and uh, for God to heal him and break up those clots uh, without any serious uh, negative effects from it. Miss Rose told me before the service that her brother is in Raleigh General and he's in critical condition, doing a little bit better today, but pray for him. And then Maria Reif is relative of Doug and Sally Vandal, and uh, her heart is uh, racing and has, she's having heart rate issues uh, Janet Tony, let's pray for her as well. And then Doug Vandal recovering from hip surgery. Doug had surgery yesterday, and I texted him. I called him yesterday, texted him today in the afternoon about 1.45, and I said, have you been discharged yet? He said, no, the doctor still isn't here. And uh, he said, I'm packed and ready to go. Uh, but Sally informed us just a few minutes later that she got the call uh, that he was ready to go. And I asked him, I said, have you been up and walking yet? And he said, I was walking today. And they had me going up and down stairs even with very little pain. And so what an answer to prayer that is. I know he's been looking forward to that surgery for a long time. That's a blessing to him. Pray for him as he recovers. You'll see the ministries of the week, the Bible hour. And then our college student of the week is Colton Davis down at Crown College. We have his address there for you. If you'd like to reach out to Colton, I know that would be an encouragement to him. And I'm sure that many of you can remember back to the days that you were in college and when you got to receive a care package or a letter from somebody that you knew. And I, I, I remember how big of a deal that was to me. And uh, let's try to be a blessing to these college students. Chris and Angel Phillips are missionaries of the month. And we're going to go ahead and have a word of prayer. We'll have our ushers come forward. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Is her name Sharon? Okay, thank you. Let's pray for these requests and ask for God's blessing on the service and the offering. Father, what a blessing it is to be together tonight and have the privilege and the freedom to study your word together. We thank you, Lord, that it is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, that it not only taught us how we could be saved, forgiven of our sins, and redeemed, but Lord, it also teaches us how we can have an abundant life, a life that's fulfilling and full of hope and joy and peace, a life that is used by you. Lord, we thank you for the health that you've given us tonight that allows us to be here, but there are many on this list that we mentioned specifically this evening. 
who are unable to be here this evening because of health or sickness or surgeries. Uh, Lord, you know each and every one of these names that I mentioned, and you know their situation even better than I do or anybody in this room does. Lord, you know what they're dealing with spiritually, emotionally, physically. And Lord, we pray for your grace just to be evident in their lives. We pray for healing. We pray for the help that only you can offer. And Father, we pray now as we meet together this evening that you would meet with us. Lord, it would be a waste of our time to come together this evening uh, to hear a man's words. Lord, we came together tonight to hear your word. And Lord, we pray that your word would speak to our hearts. Lord, I pray that as we have an opportunity to give, Lord, that our spirit would be pleasing in your sight. I pray that as we have an opportunity in a moment again to get up and sing praises to you, and even as this offertory is played, Lord, that it would be honoring and pleasing to you. Lord, do all in the service that you desire to do. We do pray for our pastor. We thank you for him and Marcia and his family. Thank you for his leadership and his faithfulness. Lord, I pray that you would be with him, that you would encourage his heart through the preaching that he hears tonight, and that he and Scott would enjoy the time that they have together and that you bring them back safely. Bless this evening. Use it as you see fit. We ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Appreciate that. so much Matt for the offertory just as I am and it's because of the grace of God that we can do just that and come as we are please stand and turn in your hymn books to page 345 we'll sing together grace that is greater than all of our sin page 345 we'll sing first second and last grace greater than our sin is greater 
you have your Bibles, you can open up to 1 Samuel chapter 1 this evening. 1 Samuel chapter 1. I know that pastor usually speaks from down on the floor, and I think the one or two times I've spoken on Wednesday night, I tried to do the same thing before, but if you allow me, I'm just going to stay up here uh, tonight um, just for, for comfort level. I actually feel a little bit more out of my comfort zone on Wednesday nights because I never even get to be up here with you on Wednesday nights. I'm always down with the teens every Wednesday night, and uh, so I'm used to watching them shoot baskets and then us going and playing games in there and, and then having a Bible study together and, and having a good time down there. And uh, I'm, I'm already getting fussed at from the sound man because my mic wasn't on. So, um, so I'm used to being down there on Wednesday nights and uh, looking forward to being up here with you this evening. I guess I could play some games with you if you wanted to. <laughs> We usually give out candy. Sometimes if I don't have candy, I give out money. And uh, I try not to do that because my wife actually gets a little frustrated with me sometimes when I give away our money. And uh, she doesn't mind if I give away candy. She just doesn't like when I give away money. And then I try to explain to her, you know, the candy costs money. So it, it didn't make a difference either way. But uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1, we're looking at this passage together. We'll begin in verse 1 this evening. Now there was a certain man... Of Ramathiam, Zophium, of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, an Ephrathite. And he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. Verse 3 And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Peninnah his wife and to all her sons and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah. But the Lord had shut up her womb. And her adversary also provoked her sore for to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her, therefore she wept and did not eat. Then said Elkanah, her husband, to her, Hannah, why weepest thou? And why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am not I better to thee than ten sons? So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but wilt give unto thine handmaid a man child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. And it came to pass as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli marked her mouth. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she had been drunken. And Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said, Let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more Sad, And they rose up in the morning early and worshipped before the Lord and returned and came to the, their house to Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. As we look at this passage, we see a family that is struggling. And we see a lady in this family who's having a particularly difficult time. And that lady was, is, of course, Hannah. You know, if we were to watch television, and I know that if you're like me, you probably don't watch a lot of modern sitcoms on television. 
But if you were watching a modern sitcom on television, the picture that they would paint of a normal family would be quite sad. It's a picture where the wife runs the home, the father is either a moron or an infidel, and his children live in complete disrespect, dishonoring and disobeying their parents frequently. And the world we live in would laugh at that. But as we look at this passage and we see what we would call in our modern vernacular a dysfunctional family, it's not something to be laughed at. It's actually something that was very sad. It was sad indeed for Hannah and so sad that her husband and others around her, including Eli, were able to see and recognize the difficulties that she was having in her life. The first thing that I'd like us to see from this passage tonight is that there was a problem in the family. In verse 1, we're introduced to Hannah's husband, Elkanah, and the character of Elkanah is shown all throughout the passage. When we look in verse 1, we're told that he's a Levite. Now, it's not specifically told there, but we're given part of his lineage. lineage. And if we were to turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 6 and look at verses 16 through 35, we would find out that he came straight out of the lineage of Levi. So when it calls him an Ephrathite, he is an Ephrathite by residence. That's where he lived. But he's a Levite by lineage. He's supposed to be part of the Lord's service in the sanctuary, as it's called here in this passage, or in the tabernacle. He was, he was a God-fearing man. We see that in verse number 3. And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Now it's interesting, he didn't just go anywhere to worship. He went to the place that God had ordained for this time period. He went to Shiloh at the time he was supposed to go to worship the Lord, and he took his family with him. So here's a man, not only is he worshiping God, not only is he trying to sacrifice to God, not only is he trying to obey God, not only is he trying to be the right example to his family, but he's trying to lead his family to follow in his footsteps. He's trying to lead them in worship, and there's a lesson in that right there. That for the men in this room as husbands and fathers in our home, it is placed upon us to lead our families in family worship, to, to lead our families and bring up our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And that's what Elkanah was doing here in this passage, and it stands out even more because towards the bottom of that verse, in verse number 3, there's an interesting phrase, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priest of the Lord, were there. Now, if I told you that this Sunday Pastor Paul would be here, you would be encouraged by that. You'd be excited and you would say, we love our pastor. We appreciate his family. We appreciate his service, his example, his ministry. But when these people looked at Hophni and Phinehas serving, it was a much different response, wasn't it? They were making people abhor the sacrifice of the Lord because of their own wicked behavior. Now we could look at a little further in the chapters and the passages here in the book of Samuel, and we could see that story about how God had to judge Eli and Hophni and Phinehas because of the wickedness that they were bringing to the worship of the Lord. They refused to obey God. But that didn't deter Elkanah from doing what was right. How many people out there today will make statements like, I used to go to church, but there's so many hypocrites there, or I was done wrong, or you don't know what happened, and I refuse to go back now. But here's the thing about that statement. We don't go to church for the people in the pews. We go to church for God. He's the one that told us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but so much the more as the day approaches. Listen, he's the one that told us to be faithful to church. It's his church. It's not a man's church. Man didn't design church. God designed church. God desires for us to be a part of the church because Christ died for the church, and we're supposed to be a part of it no matter who's there. And he had the most wicked representatives leading in worship and sacrifice there that you can imagine. And it didn't keep him from doing what was right. I grew up in a good church, 
And I am thankful for the people that God brought across my path as a young man. And I think it was just the last time I preached from this pulpit that I was choked up in tears telling you about people who invested in my life when I was a young man. When I was a teenager, uh, my youth pastor was probably my best friend at that stage of my life. And I enjoyed him so much and I loved him so much. And when he left to go take over a church in Michigan, I cried like a baby because my best friend had moved away. And he made a large impact in my life and there were many, many others. My freshman year of college was paid for partially by my pastor's wife. Uh, My parents weren't great with money and they didn't teach me about money growing up and I had been working since a young age but I really hadn't been saving up money and uh, my pastor's wife one day pulled me aside at work and she said Kevin you feel like God's called you in the ministry I said yes ma'am and she said, you you feel like God wants you to go to Bible college yes ma'am well how much money do you have saved up And she could kind of tell by the sheepish look on my face that it wasn't much. She said, do you have an account at a bank? I said, no, ma'am. She said, tomorrow I want you to bring your identification with you. I'm going to take you to the bank. I'm going to start an account for you. I'm going to put in the first deposit, and everything you put in, I'll match it. There were people in our church who played a large role in my life. But that church is no longer in existence because of some poor decisions that were made by the leadership, some failures that happened, multiple failures that happened. I don't say that to to degrade the church that I grew up at. God used that church in my life. I say that because there were other kids with me in Bible college at that time who got away from the Lord and their excuse was, I was doing fine until so-and-so did what he did. That excuse is not going to fly when we stand before Jesus Christ. We can't blame anybody else for our actions. And it didn't matter if Hophni and Phinehas were wicked or not. It was still the right thing to go sacrifice to the Lord when the God calls you to sacrifice. And so this is what Elkanah does with his family because he's a God-fearing man. His name means God has possessed or God is owner. He was faithful to take his whole family once a year to worship God at Shiloh. And then we're told, last of all, a good quality to have as a godly man. Verse number five, but unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah. Now, not everybody is called to get married. It's not God's will for every person to get married. But for those who do get married, God has a plan for husbands who get married. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. That's an unconditional, sacrificial love that puts the needs of your spouse above your own. That's what that is. And so we are to choose to love even on days when people can be harder to love. Now, my wife is never difficult to love. But I heard that sometimes people get married and, and, and they marry people that sometimes are hard to love. I've never had to experience that before. And this is Partially sarcasm. But the truth of the matter is, in our relationship, you know, just by by watching right now, by listening right now, and by knowing the two of us, if you know the two of us at all, you know who is the difficult one to love. That that would be me, okay? I, I am the one that is hard to love. But you know, before we got married, somebody put a book in our hands that I'm, I'm very grateful for. It's a book by Gary Chapman called The Five Love Languages. And it's a very common book. I'm sure many of you have heard that before. And it's the idea that not everybody expresses love the same exact way. And uh, women tend to be a little bit more complicated than men are. And as a result, my wife has like four love languages. Now, she has two primary ones. Her two primary love languages would be quality time, which confuses me. I don't understand why she would want to spend quality time with me. But but quality time is one, and the other one is acts of service. Like, it means more to her if she comes home and I've emptied the dishwasher or I've taken the clothes out of the dryer and folded them for her and put them away while, while she was gone 
If I do something like that and she comes home, that actually means more to her than if I were to buy her a gift. Now, because I'm difficult to love, I try to actually like express like four or five languages. I try to express like all five to her, okay? I compliment her every day because I enjoy her so much. I don't know if she enjoys the compliments, but I compliment her every single day. I try to buy her gifts, even though that's not her primary love language. Every once in a while, I'll do an act of service, and I try to spend quality time with her. In fact, we spent quality time in a Mexican restaurant just yesterday. All right? And so we, we try to talk to each other. We try to go out to eat with each other. We try to spend time with each other. We try to express, express love to each other. And, and here's the bottom line. My job as a husband, partially, is to find out what makes her feel loved and then to express love to her in the way that she receives it. That's part of what I am called to do. I am called to sacrifice, to meet her needs, to encourage, to love, to dwell with her according to knowledge. That is part of what I'm called to do. And one of the things that we see about Elkanah in this passage that is so commendable is that he loved his wife. He said, well, big deal. Shouldn't everybody love their wife? Yes. But there are a lot of people who don't. There are a lot of spouses who don't love each other the way that they should. They don't sacrifice for one another. They don't live selflessly. They live selfishly. And Elkanah here in this passage, he didn't live that way. So we have a good God-fearing man who loves the Lord and loves his wife and loves his family, and he's trying to lead them in the worship of the Lord. But Elkanah made one major mistake that we find in this passage and what is his major, major mistake that he makes in this passage? Verse number two. And he had... Let's try that again. And he had two wives. Now this is generally where the pastor makes a joke about it's hard enough to have one wife and keep one lady happy. You know, this is usually where the evangelist or somebody, whoever's preaching, makes that joke. I'm not going to make that joke. I'm just going to allude to it. But here's the sad thing. Did Elkanah love his wife, Hannah? Yeah, he loved her greatly. Did he want her to be happy? Did he want her to be everything that God designed her to be? Yeah. But his decision brought pain and sorrow into her, her life. And sometimes we can make decisions. And when we get outside the will of God, we're not the only ones who suffer the consequences of those decisions. Sometimes they can hurt the people that we love the most. I think we can safely say that him having two wives was not pleasing to God. Now, we find a lot of instances of polygamy in the Bible, in the Old Testament, but not because it was a prescribed method of God. If God wanted man to have two wives, he would have put two wives with Adam in the garden, right? He put one woman and one man in the garden together. And by creating one wife only as a helpmeet for the first man, he made it clear that he was against polygamy. And when Jesus spoke to the Pharisees about the law of divorce, he said, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. The apostles' teaching reiterated this when he said, let every man have his own wife and every woman her own husband. The first person to violate this principle in the Bible is found in Genesis 4.19, and it was a man named Lamech. It's just told clearly that he took unto him two wives. Does anybody know anything else about Lamech? He was a murderer. So the first instance we see of a man taking two wives in the Bible was a wicked man who was a murderer. He was a descendant of the first murderer, and he trod in the same murderous path as Cain. His example of having two wives was not followed up by the children of Seth. When Noah got on the boat, it was Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives. Okay, like one each, not six each, okay? And so... That's what we see. Now, I'm sure that Elkanah thought that he had a valid reason for taking a second wife. 
What's probably the reason that Elkanah took his second wife? Hannah couldn't have children, could she? And so because Hannah couldn't have children and he wanted to have offspring, he took a second wife and he actually followed the example of who in that? He followed the example of Abraham, didn't he? When Abraham took Hagar. And so he's practicing something that is acceptable in his culture. It's something that might have even been acceptable in his family. But every time we go against the plan of God, we not only bring pain and consequences upon ourselves, we also risk bringing pain into the lives of those that we love. So though his decision may have been acceptable in his culture and in his family, may have been part of his heritage, something that his ancestors did, but just because something is acceptable to culture does not make it biblical. And that is such an important lesson for our day and age, isn't it? Listen, we don't have, to my knowledge, any children in this room. I take that back. We do have a couple, okay? But we don't have a lot of children. We'll call them teenagers. We'll call them young adults, all right? But we don't, we don't have a lot of children in this room. But don't the children of this generation who are being taught critical race theory and gender dysphoria and that there is no God, that they came from evolution, that's what they're being taught don't they need a generation our age who teaches them that the Bible supersedes whatever culture says is acceptable? Because culture is yelling at them that we're wrong. Culture is yelling at them that this is an antiquated way of thinking, that it's not true, and that everybody enlightened knows that it's a farce. And I hate that term enlightened because the only time people use the term enlightened is when they're actually living in spiritual darkness and rejecting the light and truth of God's Word. Our culture needs people in our generation. I understand we're not all in the same generation in here. Joe's a young man starting off in life, just going to college. And there are other people on the opposite end of the spectrum that college or high school was a long, long, long time ago. But what I am saying is that the kids in Cranberry Baptist Church, they need every generation in this church living the same example and teaching the same lesson that the Bible supersedes whatever our government or whatever our culture says is true. And so he didn't have to capitulate to his culture. Daniel lived in a wicked culture, right? In Babylon? Correct? A culture that was trying to brainwash him, change his belief system, make him polytheistic, make him forget the one true God. But he didn't capitulate to his culture, did he? He, 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 he had decided that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat. We're not to be conformed to this world. We are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind that we might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And the only way that we can be transformed and our mind can be renewed is as we meditate on the Scripture. It is the Scripture that renews our mind. That's why God said, This book of law shall not depart of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. How do we obey God's law? By meditating on it. By meditating on it continually and consistently. That's why he said in Psalm 1 that he walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor sitteth in the way, standing away in the sinners, nor sitteth as he is scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in the law doth he meditate day and night. You see, when we get away from the scriptures, life starts getting confusing. Because some of the arguments that can be used that are contrary to Scripture can actually, if you're not in the Bible, start to sound convincing sometimes. And we start to get confused. But we have to meditate on the Scripture so that our mind can be renewed. Elkanah's decision may have been acceptable to his culture, 
may have even been acceptable to the children of God during his day, but his decision was not acceptable to God. And as a result, his decision brought unintended pain and consequences in the lives of those that he loved the most. Now, obviously, obviously, we don't have a problem with polygamy in this church. That's not why I'm talking about this. What is the principle? The principle is that there are areas in life where we can be prone to step outside the will of God and think that it's okay. Think that we have a good reason to disobey an almighty God. To give into your flesh. To compromise. It could be in your speech, your temper, holding on to bitterness or hatred when God tells you you're supposed to forgive. It can be a critical, judgmental, or complaining spirit. It could be a thought life or what you choose to watch or the way you talk to your spouse or children. There's a thousand different ways, and we don't have time to list all of them, do we? But sometimes we can start to accept things in our life that are not the will of God and start to think that it's not hurting anybody. But that's a lie of the devil. So, we see this lie of sin. That some sins aren't a big deal, and that some sins aren't going to cause a problem, and it's not going to hurt anybody else, and it's not going to affect anybody else. But you look at the story of Eve, and what was the horrible sin that Eve and Adam committed? They ate a piece of fruit. By the way, that is why I still refuse to eat fruit. And, and because vegetables are a close cousin, I won't eat those either. I, I primarily live in like the chocolate realm. That's, that's where I live. Sugar, carbs, it's, it's, not a very, it's not a good thing. Pray for me, please. They ate fruit. Now, could you imagine if your child got kicked out of school for eating a piece of fruit? You would think that was harsh, wouldn't you? You'd probably go and talk to the principal, wouldn't you? It's not the eating of the fruit that was sin. What was it? It was the rebellion against God's law. And Eve was convinced that it wasn't a big deal, that it wouldn't hurt that much, and I'll just give it a try. And as a result, when Adam willingly chose to disobey God, it brought a sin nature upon every person who's ever been born. And every person is born dead in their trespasses and sins. From a little sin that really wasn't going to affect anybody. Think of Achan. What was Achan's sin? He took the bacon, right? Achan took the bacon. He was there in Jericho. He wasn't supposed to take the, the garment. He wasn't supposed to take the wedge of silver. He wasn't supposed to take anything of the goods. It was all supposed to belong to God. It was the first fruits. God got the first victory. They would get the spoils from all the other victories. But the first was supposed to be given to God. And when nobody else was around, Achan took something that didn't belong to him, and he hid it, and he probably thought, it's not a big deal Nobody's going to know. It's not going to hurt anyone. He wasn't the only one who got punished for it, was he? It affected his whole family. You think David's sin affected other people? You think it affected Bathsheba and Uriah, Amnon and Absalom and Adonijah and his kingdom? When his own son rebelled against him, his son had major, or his sin had major effects on his family and his kingdom and his walk with the Lord. And then you see Lot. Lot moved into a place he knew he shouldn't have been. How do we know he knew he shouldn't have been there? Because at the beginning, he wasn't comfortable going there, was he? He just pitched his tent in that direction, but he knew, I can't really go there. It's not a good place for me and my family but I'll just kind of look that way. And he pitched his tent that direction, but eventually he got comfortable with sin. He got what we call desensitized. Got a little bit closer and a little bit closer and started to visit until eventually he smack dab sitting right there in the gate, right? It vexed his righteous soul by what he saw and heard in Sodom every day. 
And he lost his daughters who were married. And his sons-in-laws. And his wife. Because his sin was a big deal. And sin has consequences, and it doesn't always just affect us. A lot of times it affects those that we love. And so as a result, God wants us to live a pure life, completely consecrated to him. So what is the problem? He gave in to the culture rather than following God's plan. The second thing we see is the pain that helped to form Hannah. The pain that helped to form Hannah. Look at verse number 2. Oh, and he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Now, that's horrible for anybody who desires to have children, but we must remember back in their culture, if you were unable to have children, what was that considered? Let me rephrase it this way. Having children was considered to be God's blessing upon your life. So back then, not having children was considered to be a curse from God. Now we see, did Hannah do anything here that would have caused God to curse her in the story. We don't, we don't see anything in Hannah's disposition or in her life. In fact, if we look at this story, who probably should have been the one not able to have children if that was the case? Panina, right? Because she's the one being harsh and cruel. And that's the danger of this story. You know, sometimes we can look at life and say, that person doesn't even love the Lord, and that person's living in sin, and that person's not even doing right, and that person's rebelling against God, and look at how God's blessing them, and why does life have to be so difficult for me? And don't you think Hannah could have fallen into that trap here in this passage? Panina's being nasty, and Panina's being harsh, and Panina's being mean, and God's blessed Panina with children. And Hannah's trying to worship the Lord and she's trying to live for God and she's trying to love her husband and God hasn't saw fit to give her children at this point. Verse number six, we see the second problem. I've already alluded to it. And her adversary, her enemy also provoked her sore for to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. It wasn't bad enough that she couldn't have children, but the other lady that her husband was married to had to mock her about it and make her feel bad. And what is the result? In verse number 10, it says, And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. You know, we want when we're going through pain to be relieved of pain and difficulties and trials as quickly as possible in our lives, in the lives of those that we love, in the lives of our children and our family members, we want to be relieved of pain, we want to be relieved of difficulties, and we want it to happen as quick as possible to get out of the pain. None of us enjoy being in pain, none of us enjoy suffering, none of us enjoy sorrow or trials or tribulations. Those are difficult things in life, and I'm not making light of it. But what I would like us to realize is that we can learn as believers in the midst of trials and tribulations. Without these trials, would Hannah ever have given Samuel back to God as a three-year-old? I don't know the answer to that, but my guess is if she was able just to have children from a young age, there probably wouldn't have been the motivation there to give that child back to God. Now, he was going to be a Levite. His adult life, part of it was going to be spent for at least 20 years serving God in some capacity. But she gave God his whole life, didn't she? He already belonged to God, but she gave him back to God anyways. That's a great lesson for every parent who still has children in their home. Listen, our children already belong to God. They were created by God. They ultimately belong to God. But every parent needs to come to a place in their life where they make a decision too that I give my children to God. They're not mine. They belong to him to do whatever he wants with them. I've seen so many parents say, I won't let my child do this and I won't let my child do that. And my child wants to serve in this capacity, but they need to. And I've seen that happen over and over and over again where where parents, there were times they actually kept them from the will of God. We're supposed to be pushing our children towards the will of God. Begging God to use them. Begging God to do a work in their lives that we're not able to do. 
Would Daniel have been the man he was had his home never been destroyed? Or Joseph, had he not been sold into slavery? David, if his sheep had never been attacked by lions and bears? I don't know if David would have been prepared to fight Goliath had he not fought a lion and a bear already. See, God used something difficult in his life to prepare him for something great later in life. Is anybody in here familiar with the name Peggy Covell? Anybody? It's not a name I was really familiar with either, but I was reading an argument, and Covell's parents had been missionaries to Japan and were captured and killed by Japanese soldiers in 1943. Before the Japanese beheaded the Covells, they asked for 30 minutes to pray. And their daughter thinks, she believes that in that time, much of what they were praying for was for God to forgive those who were about to execute them. You know what Peggy did with her life after her parents were executed for serving God as missionaries? It was a tragic event that led Peggy to spend her time during the war caring for Japanese prisoners of war so that she could try to reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. At that same time, there was a man named Jacob DeShazer. You might be more familiar with his name. On December 7, 1941, that's a day that's infamous in our history. I don't have to tell you what day that was. Pearl Harbor was attacked, and after the attack, a man named Jacob DeShazer joined the army Air Corps at the age of 27. He was part of the Doolittle Raid to bomb Japan, and his B-25 tried to make it back to safety in China, but went down over enemy territory. He was captured and was in several POW camps for 40 months. 34 of those months he spent in solitary confinement. He was beaten, he was malnourished, and three of the crew that were captured with them were executed by firing squad. Sometimes the soldiers would march all of them out and pull up guns and point them at them and then put the guns back down and put them back in their cells just to torture them. The guards tortured them on a daily basis and one of the lieutenants even died of starvation. And it was during DeShazer's time in prison, as he saw the cruelty of his captors, he developed a deep hatred towards them. But after about 25 months, he asked for a Bible. And one of the guards gave him a Bible, and they said he only had three weeks with the book. And during those three weeks, he learned what Jesus had done to forgive him. And as he studied the Bible, he learned to forgive those who were torturing him. He learned to speak their language. And he vowed that if he ever got out of there, someday he would bring the message of salvation back to Japan. After the war, he returned to the U.S., trained as a missionary, and returned to Japan to share the love of Christ with his former enemies. And it's estimated that some 30,000 Japanese citizens became Christians because of his ministry. But where did he meet Christ? When he was being tortured in a prisoner of war camp. One of the men that got saved as a result of his testimony was a man named Mitsuo Fuchida. Fuchida planned the attack on Pearl Harbor and led the attack on Pearl Harbor. God miraculously protected him in, in many different ways. One time he was in Hiroshima the day before we dropped the atomic bomb and he was called to go to Tokyo for something and had he not gotten that order he would have died that day. He was sent with the group to see the damage and everybody else died from radiation. He was the only one who survived and at a train station in Tokyo he received a track and on the track it said I was a prisoner of a Japan. It was written by Jacob DeShazer. It was through the testimony of DeShazer and Peggy who he also knew about from some prisoners that he knew. It was through their testimonies that God started to use their love to teach Fuchida about his love. He got saved sometime later, and eventually one day in America, DeShazer was in his home and a knock came on his door. 
and Mitsuo Fuchida was standing at his door. DeShazer had said when he joined the army that if he had the chance to ever kill the person who led the attack on Japan, he wouldn't hesitate to murder that man. But that day, Fuchida told him how he had gotten saved as a result of DeShazer's track. They hugged as brothers in Christ. No longer enemies, they were part of the same family. They spent the rest of their lives traveling throughout the country, doing crusades together, telling people about how Christ came and died to save us from our sins. That's a great story. I'm sure it wasn't great when DeShazer was in the prison. I'm sure it wasn't great when Peggy lost her parents. I'm sure it wasn't great when they were going through difficulties, but what was God able to do in those difficulties? God was able to do a miracle in their hearts. God was able to use them in a way that they never really probably thought they could have been used prior to that. All I'm saying is, as humans, we want to avoid pain at all costs, but sometimes it's in the midst of pain that we draw closest to God. You know, I think it's even a bigger danger as parents Because as parents, we want to do everything we can to protect our children from pain and difficulties and sometimes even consequences. But we need to be careful that we don't become so protective that we keep them from God's plan for their lives. Hannah was facing a trial. It was a trial that God had allowed in her. Who made her barren? God. It was a trial that got exasperated by a decision that her husband made. A husband who loved her, but brought more difficulty into her life because of his decisions. So how did she respond? She responded with a prayer of faith. If you look at verse 5, Elkanah tried to please Hannah, and he tried to console Hannah in verse number 8, but none of those things brought peace to Hannah. So in the midst of her pain and her suffering, what did she do? She turned to God. Look at verse number 10, if you would. We're almost done. And she was in bitterness of soul. She said, I can't eat. He had given her a double portion to eat after the sacrifice, and he wanted to make her happy, and he was doing everything he could to make her happy, but this was a problem that only God could fix. She was in bitterness of soul. She didn't want to eat. She was in pain and sorrow and suffering. And so what does she do? And she was in bitterness of soul, and look at the next two words. And she prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. This prayer was not pretty. She is pouring out her heart to God. She is weeping. She's conducting herself in such a way that the priest thinks that she's even drunk. But God answered this prayer. What are some things about this prayer that we can learn? First of all, the prayer was simple. You know what the prayer was? The prayer was, remember me. You remember what Samson's prayer was after he was taken captive by the Philistines and he wanted to avenge and take care of his enemies? You know what his prayer was? You know how it started off? Remember me. What about the thief on the cross when he prayed that great theological prayer for salvation? What was his prayer? Remember me. She just says, God, would you look at me? Would you remember me? Would you help me? Would you do something in my life that nobody else is able to do for me? I need you right now. I need your help. It was a plea for help. We see that in verse number 11. And God, our great God, delights in helping his children. She poured out her heart to God. She prayed fervently. You can see that in verse 12. And in verse 18, you see that she prayed in faith. In verse 11, you see the unselfish nature of her prayer. She vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but wilt give unto thine handmaid a man-child. This is a very specific request. She doesn't just ask for a child. She asks for a man-child. She said, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life. She doesn't even want the son to keep him for herself. She just wants God's blessing on her life and she wants to give the blessing right back to God. God gives us blessings in this life so that we can use them for His honor and glory. 
How does God respond? He answers her prayer. And she rejoices in God's blessing. She keeps her vow and she remembers to worship God for His goodness. And here's the great thing about God. He blesses above and beyond what she asked for. What did she ask for? She asked for one man child. She asked for one boy, right? One boy is what she asked for. God gave her three sons and two daughters. You can see that in chapter 2 and verse 21. Because we have a God who does exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think. So she asked for this, and God gave her this. So what did we learn from this passage? Well, we looked at it, and just because something is acceptable to our culture, or even acceptable in the modern day church, does not mean that it is necessarily acceptable to God. And poor decisions that take us outside the will of God can... result in unnecessary burdens in our family and unintended consequences of those that we love. You know, we can be on both sides of that coin. We can be the one bringing consequences and unintended consequences and pain into our family, or we can be the one suffering because of somebody else's decision. If you're Elkanah in the room tonight and you're doing something outside of the will of God, you're allowing things in your life thinking it's not a big deal, I would encourage you for the sake of the people that you love, for the sake of your walk with God and your testimony, confess and forsake the sin so that God will have mercy. Because he that covered the sin shall not have mercy. But there's probably a lot of people on the other side. They're the Hannah. They're going through some difficult things in their life, not even of their own making necessarily. They're struggling with decisions that somebody else made that are bringing pain and sorrow into their life. I want to remind you of two things. Pain, while not pleasant, can be used for good in the believer's life. God can use difficulties in this life to shape and mold you into the person that He wants to be. So don't resent trials, but rather run to God in the midst of your sorrows. The last thing i like to remind you of is that prayer works. You know what the result of Hannah's prayer was? Yes, God answered the prayer for one son and added five other children. And Samuel was greatly used of God. But prayer also brought peace into Hannah's life. Look, look with me. Like I said, we're, my head, I'm going to get reprimanded for this. We're almost done. All right? Nobody likes it when a pastor says four different times, we're almost done, we're almost done, we're almost done, we're almost done. My wife says, you'd be better off just going and not getting people's hopes up. But we're, we're almost done. That's good advice, by the way. Verse 17, then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and thy God of Israel grant thee the petition that thou hast asked of him. I was like, I don't even know if he's promising her that God's going to answer the prayer. Or if this is just kindness. Oh, honey, I hope God answers that prayer. I don't know. I don't know. But because she prayed in faith, and she poured out her heart to God, and she believed in prayer, what was her response? Verse 18, And she said, Let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat. And her countenance was no more sad. And they rose up in the morning early and worshiped before the Lord. All of a sudden, everything flips. Her heart is overwhelmed with the pain and suffering that she's going through and the persecution from a family member and and the, the fact that she thought that God had forgotten her and why haven't you blessed me like you've blessed others, God, and why have you done this in my life? But she falls on her face before God. Rather than retaliating, rather than resenting, she goes to God and she seeks Him out. She runs to God and she begs Him to do something in her life that she can't do for herself. And all of a sudden, what happens the peace that passeth all understanding enters in. We like that verse. Be careful for nothing. Some of us like that verse. Be careful for nothing, but in everything through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Most of us can all quote that. But what does the next verse say? The next verse is a promise. That's a principle. Here's the promise. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You know what the result is of running to God? The result is peace. You know what the result is of dealing with the problem yourself? 
resentment, retaliation, a complaining spirit, a harsh spirit. Bitterness can enter in. Fear can enter in. Worry can enter in. Those aren't the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace. God says we can have peace, but it's only as we run to Him with our problems and lay them at His feet. George Mueller is probably the number one man that we think of when we think of prayer, or at least for me. He says, It is not enough to begin to pray, nor to pray aright, nor is it enough to continue for a time to pray, but we must patiently, believingly continue in prayer until we obtain an answer. And further, we have not only to continue in prayer until the end, but we have also to believe that God does hear us and will answer our prayers. Most frequently, we fail in not continuing in prayer until the blessing is obtained. And, not, and in not expecting the blessing. Now because he had that belief that God will answer my prayer, he also said this, I believe that God has heard my prayers. He will make it manifest in his own good time that he's heard me. I have recorded my petitions that when God has answered them, his name will be glorified. In other words, because he prayed in faith, what was the result? He had peace, didn't he? I believe that in God's time, He'll answer my prayer and I can trust Him with it. God's good and He knows what He's doing. And I'm just going to trust Him with it. May the Lord help us to be like Hannah, to be like George Mueller in this passage, that when we're going through difficult problems, problems that maybe we made for ourselves, or problems maybe somebody, even, somebody else even made for us without even intending to do so, that rather than resenting or retaliating or retreating in our spiritual life, that we run to the cross, we run to our Savior with our prayer requests, and we cast our burdens upon the Lord, understanding that He cares for us, and allow the peace of God to do something in our life that we can't do for ourselves. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes. Father, we thank You for the truth of Your Word, the power that it contains, the difference that it can make in our lives, the truths that we're so are so applicable to our daily living. Lord, we, we live in a world of sin, and so there's going to be problems. Some of those problems we bring into our own life through our own decisions, but there are times where trials are in our life that are not even of our own making. But you know, and you are able. In fact, you're able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think, and if we'll come to you with our prayers and trust you, Trust your goodness, trust your will, and not be determined to have our way, but be willing to trust you. Lord, you can give us a peace that passeth all understanding. Lord, we pray for safety as we travel home tonight. Help us to be doers of your word, not hearers only. Help us to apply the truths uh, that we've studied this evening, if need be. And we ask and praise things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we appreciate you coming out on a Wednesday night and pray for Pastor to get home safely tomorrow, he and Scott. And uh, they're actually going to be turning right back around, I think, and Pastor and Marsha are going to be used down in Texas at a couple's retreat. And I can't think of a better couple to speak at a couple's retreat. And that's not just puffing up Miss Marsha over here, okay? And you know because I say these types of things when they're not here. But I can't think of a couple who's a better example and who can be more of a help to, to, to people. And so we're blessed to have them, and, uh, but unselfishly we're willing to share them as well so that they can be a blessing to others. So pray for them as they go to minister there this weekend as well. Have a wonderful week.